He throws it out the window. So when she comes back, she takes a bat and starts to hit him in the head over and over again. And he, he wrestles the bat away from her, kills her. Then the cops come. He kills the cops. He kills the judge. He kills the hangman. And then finally he goes to hell and he kills Satan with a bat. And that's the plot. <laughs> <laughs> he's intimidating he's yeah. physically intimidating he's a big guy with mm -hmm. uh, strong opinions yeah. yes and he will talk to you about them at length been working and known him for a long time and when we're not imagining suplexing each other we're we tend to get along <laughs> I, a lot of people have told me that i'm quite intimidating when you first meet me i can't help but be six foot six i mean that's that's the way it is i have this big scary Viking beard because I'm doing a play. I don't, I don't want it. I, I'm stuck with it right now. <laughs> okay. No matter how far I go, I know what I'm supposed to contribute with my lifetime. I didn't really choose to do theater; it chose me. But uh, I know I'm passionate about it to the uh, to the exclusion of almost everything else. Everything else, relationships, jobs, money, whether I eat or not, I am passionate about theater. It's true though, as soon as you have a camera crew following you, everybody's like, what a dick. <laughs> that guy's a dick. <laughs> you know, he writes the shows, gets the space, the gets crew. people around him to do it. But there, we're not talking government grants, we're not talking corporate sponsorships. At some point he just kind of turned away and said, okay, I'm not going to go cap in hand anymore, I'm going to do my own stuff. I think I do what I want. I don't think I'm unduly influenced by whether it's going to sell or whether anybody's going to want to see it. Uh, I feel like I've got that down. I'm doomed to a very low budget, but I do do what I want, exactly what I want in terms of content. If I had my own theater, I would be over the moon ecstatic. That, uh, I've often thought I want a commune. Like I want to go out into the country and we'll grow our own rice and we'll all live in one big house and we'll put on plays and people will drive to see them. But then all my friends are like, oh yeah, but you, you're going to be the cult leader, right? And we're going we're gonna to have all our babies in common. It's, it's going to go south, right? That's, so yeah. I yeah. don't think he would be able to survive if he wasn't writing every single day. Uh, his writing, first of all, he has this immaculate writing, printing, I think. Printing, he printing. prints in a book, in a notebook. Yeah, notebook with a pen. And I don't know if it's, this is the case Prolific. anymore, but he would just write. <laughs> yeah. He would write from start yes. to finish, and when he's done, there's his play. Balzac is famous for being able to write 15 hours in a row. Um, I, I would die. Like, I would just collapse after... I, I'm, I can barely do two pages with it, without having to stop. It's like bleeding, kind of, you know? <laughs> it's like, there's only so much creativity in you that day. And then, like, just like you can only donate so much blood, and then you pass out. You can only spill so much creativity. He always has an eye for the, uh, the uh, underdog. Yeah. And he writes about that a lot. And I think he relates to that from his own personal experience. That's what holds all my work together. It's about outsiders. Um, it's sort of about the people who don't, I, 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 who don't get a lot of, of exposure. Um, so that really is what holds it all together. My very first play was called Hollis Gets the Girl. It was about a mentally challenged man who sort of fell in love. He fell in love with a quote unquote normal girl and everybody was mad at him for it. And, so that, it started with that, and then uh, that's really been a continuous theme. Even some of these celebrities that I'm writing about, uh, I mean, I've written plays about Jack the Ripper, about Chet Baker, Arthur Rimbaud. They're all outsiders. They're all people who were, were never fully accepted. Even Warhol, as famous as he is, uh, like we've been talking about, people despised him. Do I make you angry, Jean-Michel? Are you attacking me as a symbol? My parents always encouraged me to draw. Uh, there was always art supplies around. 
Um, I even got sent to the school psychologist once for drawing uh, Santa Claus killing a bunch of reindeer. So uh, I was always into the dark, even back, even back when I was a child, even back when I was single digits of age. Yeah, I might. It, it, it's hard to be, not be macabre when you have a, a tombstone epitaph as a, as a surname. I've been clinically dead twice, and this was at a very young age. So I think it's perfectly, perfectly reasonable that I do with macabre subject matter. Not only do I feel like the rest of my life is a great gift because of that, I feel like I've been to the other side. You know. <laughs> Did you tell us anything about the other no, side? No, because I was like three. I don't, I don't remember any of it. <laughs> I wish I did. Maybe it comes back to me in dreams. I don't know about it. People aren't going to go see a play where a bunch of people yell at each other and swear at each other. Um, they want the singing and dancing. They want to leave the theater with their toes tapping and a big smile on their face. I don't want to give that to them. If you uh, piss him off, he'll blacklist you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sometimes for years. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's yeah. true. He won't talk to you. He doesn't want to work with you. But he is an, an exceptionally gifted individual from the standpoint, as you said, from the grassroots. He does everything. He's probably the last remaining soul to do so. I am the one that didn't leave. My peers did leave. The ones that were producing stuff around the turn of the century, they left and achieved you know, certain degrees of success in other parts of the world. But I feel like I'm ingrained now, and I feel like this is my town, and I'm the last, in a way, I'm the last man standing, uh, in terms of a guy who writes. I've never been able to support myself fully doing theater, which is really my only goal at this point. So I've done a lot of work with uh, people with mental challenges. I work at a homeless shelter now. Um, I try to get in there, again, marginalized people. I try to get in there. Uh, a part of it was I, what, I was thinking that I wasn't, um, I wasn't walking the talk, you know. I did a play about homelessness in London, and I was like, what the hell do I know about that? So uh, I went and started working there, <laughs> working at a homeless shelter. morning person. Oh, uh, in person. Jason very often would, um, usually around 10, 1030, would say, I'm going to the coffee shop at night, and then he'd be gone. And he just would like to people watch. A lot of times he'd go out to the Husky uh, truck stop and order the big greasy breakfast at around midnight and just sort of watch the people and get inspired and always with notebook in hand and always writing. Now the thing is, uh, to, having written 81 scripts, that meant that was a lot of time I wasn't traveling. That was a lot of time I wasn't in relationships. That was a lot of time I wasn't drinking at the bar. So I feel like, in a way, my life has gone more uh, more insular uh, because of it. Like I, the life of a writer is is the life of sitting with a coffee at a desk. So again, I don't really have time for other aspects of life. I think uh, every day I wake up thanking the powers that be that I have no no children, that I have no family. Because I don't know, they, I always think they're going to grow up and they're going to write Cats in the Cradle songs about me, you know, because I'll be always be at the rehearsal hall. I couldn't even be Prime Minister because I wouldn't be able to go to the G7 Summit because I'd have rehearsal. <laughs> the idea is to produce your life's work while you're, you're able to. And I, again, I feel great now that I have 81 and say 10% of them are, are pretty good. Um, I just feel great because uh, I could leave the world tomorrow and I, have, I, I feel like I have a legacy of sorts. I feel like I'll be a footnote in somebody's, uh, you know, PhD in history or something like that. I feel like that was a nice big house for a Thursday opening and uh, all this, nothing fell down. I feel good. I feel like we really started with a good run.
but I don't know. Read his work. My life was about writing stuff. Unless it changes. I mean, every now and then I have this urge to just drop it all, right? And run off and join the circus or something. 